excited for this panel. Um, I think it's really interesting that when we talk about issues that women care about, security comes up. But talking to different women, security means different things. Well, the good news for today is we've got it all covered. <laughs> And I am so excited to, to be able to moderate this. I think you guys are gonna have some great questions too. Um, but I have wonderful panelists for you. Claudia Rosette is a amazing journalist, foreign correspondent extraordinaire, somebody I've looked up to for a long time for her courageous reporting in Beijing and Moscow. And she's gonna be talking about national security and foreign policy, some of the dangers we face and the solutions that could keep us safe. Um, next to her, Julie Gunlock, an old mentor of mine, um, the, actually the person who got me in the door at Independent Women's Forum. And one of the things that I enjoy so much about her is she heads the Culture of Alarmism Project, but she does so with such a great sense of humor and a levity. Um, she's a true happy warrior. Uh, rounding out our panel of courageous and funny women, Ash So, uh, she writes a lot for the Washington Examiner on Culture War. Where are you now? Real Clear Investigations. Real clear investigations. Um, she writes a lot about culture wars, She's been great on the Title IX issues on campus, some of the more thorny politics where stating an opinion is a, a difficult and touchy thing to do. She's done it with grace, and I am just thrilled to have her here. So to kick this off, um, I, I wanted to start by letting each of my panelists give you a little bit of their opinion on where things stand since we have such a broad topic. Um, I was hoping that each of you could give about five or six minutes, talk a little bit about your issue of safety and security but also discuss how it relates to feminism, and by the way, how you define feminism, because that seems to be a pertinent issue for safety and security. We'll kick it off, Claudia. Thank you, thanks for that lovely introduction. Thank you, very much. Hi everybody, um, feminism. I've always actually tried to avoid defining it because it always seemed to invite then being boxed into something. Um, and uh, that, I guess, leads me to how I will try to define it today because it's actually about not being boxed in, and it's, uh, it's about freedom, not about entitlements. And I guess I would boil it down to, maybe you remember um, the life of Julia, rolled out in the 2012 election, the faceless woman who was born with a, her hand out and who at every stage of life received the government dole, and this was supposed to be the great success for feminism. I would say that's the very opposite of what we should be looking for. What we're talking about is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness versus the life of Julia. Um, I'm gonna go into foreign policy just quickly in one anecdote. Also, if you cover things abroad, you run into a wildly sliding scale of what it means to be a woman doing the things that you might wanna do. Um, and in 1990, when I was working for the Wall Street Journal in East Asia, uh, I was back in the States and my boss sent me to a women's conference in Washington. And all these fancy women were talking there, uh, Diane Sawyer and Andrea Mitchell and everybody. And they were sitting there talking about how many bylines women got on page one. And next to me was a Russian woman journalist from what we then called Leningrad, St. Petersburg. This was 1990, the year before the Soviet Union collapsed. And she was frankly sort of a mess. She had a really bad dye job in her hair and her clothes were what you would get in Leningrad in 1990. And someone had paid for her to fly over to this conference. And we're sitting there next to each other. And she leans over and she says to me, you know, I have a problem I don't know how to solve. So what's that? She said, we used to back all these reformers in the Leningrad government, as this was as the Soviet Union was teetering toward collapse. And now they're in power. And they're, they're just as corrupt as the people we were criticizing. And we don't know what to do. We don't know whether to expose this or what to do. And I said, I really don't know what to advise you because it's your neck on the line. You have to be there. But that's certainly a large problem. Bigger to my mind than how many bylines you get on page one. And then she said, do you know where I could get a good haircut? I said, that problem I think we can solve. <laughs> we're in the heart of the capitalist country. Come on. Let's leave this discussion of page one bylines and go get you a good haircut. So you can go back and decide feeling a little bit better. And somewhere in that is what goes on really with real feminism. And with that, I'll turn it over to oh, Julie. Thank you. Um, so I'm, um, Jillian said that I'm a happy warrior and I hate to be so negative in this next uh, presentation, but there are things, part of my job is uh, running this 
program that tries to reassure people is also pointing out that when we're so worried about nonsense, we sort of forget that there are actual things to be worried about. And so I want to take a, 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 I want to be a little bit more negative in this presentation, and sorry to do that, but by 2030, um, the world population will be 8.5 billion people. Um, to put that in perspective, the current population is, is 7.3 billion. Um, by 2050, 9.7 billion, and by 2100, uh, thankfully I'll be dead, um, it'll be 11.2 billion. So um, again, th these are really huge numbers, and the question is, um, how will we feed these people? Um, how, where will we put them? Um, these are really important questions. Um, most of these population increases will happen um, in uh, developing nations, mostly in Africa, and mostly in countries that are already troubled uh, by, re by a lack of resources and internal strife. Um, in Africa, I mean, I think many people who aren't familiar with agriculture in Africa think of these sort of vast swaths of desert, but actually agricultural production in Africa has increased steadily. Um, but it's usually achieved by cultivating more land and by mobilizing larger, a larger labor force. Um, most people own family farms in Africa and most of that labor is women. Um, so women do most of the work. Um, sadly, the rules of uh, land ownership and the transfer of land rights um, is less favorable to women. So essentially we have a situation where women are doing all the work, um, they're getting very little of the money, um, and because they haven't modern, African countries largely have not modernized uh, their agriculture programs, we have them using more land and less yield, meaning less food. Um, this has become a humanitarian crisis in Africa. Uh, the UN uh, estimates that 795 million people currently in Africa live with chronic malnutrition. Um, in Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, Northeast Nigeria alone, more than 20 million people face hunger and even starvation. Um, these, this is obviously drought and some crop failures, um, but there are internal conflicts. These main, the, many of these countries are unstable. There's another issue in Southeast Asia of vitamin A deficiency. I think there's lots of moms in this room and it's really weird to think that children can go blind or die from a lack of vitamin A, but that's very common in Southeast Asia. Well, I, I, you know, I, go, I can walk two blocks to a CVS and get a box of Cheerios and it's fortified with all sorts of vitamins and nutrients, but in many countries where they subsist on very small amounts of food or types of food, there's not a varied diet, um, children can die um, from vitamin A. So um, some of the solutions here, obviously, um, I'm going to point to is modernizing um, their agriculture systems um, through the use of modern farming techniques and GMO seed, um, which uh, GMO seeds are, are drought resistant, they're disease resistant, they use less land and they use less chemicals on, on that land and the yields are very high. And certainly for vitamin A deficiency, there has been a product called GMO golden rice, which contains, it's been modified to contain vitamin A. So you think, great, yay, this is wonderful. But radical environmental groups, it's like Greenpeace and many other um, uh, environmental groups have really focused in on Africa on vulnerable populations to frighten people about GMOs, telling the populations that there are myriad um, health problems associated with them. Um, they've done the same in Asia, suggesting golden rice will harm children. Um, and golden rice has yet to be deployed and GMOs have largely um, been avoided in Africa. And so, you know, you have a lot of people in the West, um, here in, in wealthy countries, um, and part of environmental groups that are promoting the idea that GMOs and modern agriculture systems are dangerous. And I think we need to remember that the costs are high for this. There is a humanitarian crisis, and because of the misinformation being promoted by these groups, we have people that are facing starvation. As far as feminism goes, look, you know, one area I sort of have avoided it as well, but I will tell you, um, you know, I've always believed feminism is making the choices that, that are best for you and your family. But I will also say, relevant to what I've just talked about, um, you know, there are women in sub-Saharan Africa that are doing tremendously physically difficult work and because of the lies and distortions by Western environmental groups aren't um, sort of uh, developing, uh, their, their governments and their countries aren't developing systems that will make it easier for them and give them more choices. Um, so that's how I would tie it in there. Ash? 
Well, we just got to hear about some super important and dignified issues from Claudia <laughs> and Julie, and I'm just here to talk about sex. So, um, oh, that's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even think of a funny thing to say. <laughs> so um, I always get the funnest topics. Anyway, um, so, so before I get to that, uh, I want to kind of step back to how I define feminism. And, and I think I'm along the lines of both of these wonderful women here in that it, it, it is being a, a, a choice, you know, being able to make the choice that is best for you, whether it is being, taking care of your family and being a stay-at-home stay mom, or whether going childless and having, uh, you know, whatever career you want and anything in between. Um, and, and I think a lot of the problems that we have as conservatives is trying to say that is, is so many people, especially in the media and the left, I mean, obviously excluding us, that um, are, are seemingly telling women that those choices aren't okay, that the only way to be a feminist is to make the choices we tell you to make. And, you, and you've literally seen that. I don't remember exactly who tweeted it out, or was it um, the woman from Cosmo, I believe, had the whole article about, like, you in order to be a true feminist, you must be a Democrat. You know, you must support liberal policies because those are the only ways to help women and, and free women and get women ahead and empower women. You know, basically, conservative theories, uh, pro-life issues are all anti-woman. Um, and you see those issues and that kind of mentality really bad on college campuses today, especially when it comes toward uh, the idea of campus sexual assault. Now, of course, we do know that rape and sexual assault do happen on college campuses. Um, one of the examples I, I would say is uh, Vanderbilt, in which a man and his friends carried his utterly passed out girlfriend into a dorm. Uh, they kind of broke the door as they were getting in, and they're on camera carrying her basically lifeless body in, and then proceeded to take her into the room and all take turns having sex with her while filming it and laughing. And then you have what's happened from issue, uh, situations like that, you have this broadening of the definition of sexual assault to now basically include anything a woman doesn't like, whether it's during, after, or months or years from now, if you suddenly don't like the guy or if the guy has you know, somehow hurt you in some way, well, you know, you were drunk one night when you, when you hooked up with him, therefore it's rape and sexual assault. And, and for me, part of my definition of feminism and, and what I see as truly empowering is not the solution that is broadening this definition to absurd lengths and basically saying we can't, um, you know, if a woman is, has had any amount of alcohol, then, you know, they, they claim that it's uh, incapacitated, right? But it, we see more and more the definition is merely intoxicated. If you had any kind of alcohol, the guy has to just walk away, right? Because otherwise, you're, you're done. Um, and so I don't find it empowering at all to basically be told, I can't handle my alcohol and I need a man to take care of me when I've had any alcohol because just silly me, I can't handle myself and <laughs> I can't make decisions and any decision I make is null and void if I've had any alcohol and I don't find that empowering at all. If I were drunk and got behind the wheel of a car, they wouldn't let me off the hook and say, well, you couldn't make a decision. You're a woman and you were drinking. I find that infantilizing and incredibly insulting. And yet here we are on college campuses. So I, um, that's, that's, that's my spiel. So I'll turn it back over. Great. Uh, well, I, I like your point. That was surprisingly about... PG. It was surprisingly PG. I can go darker. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> we may get there. <laughs> Um, well, I, I was interested to hear your point about um, feminism and women's empowerment. It is kind of the best of times and the worst of times for women in many respects. And I agree with you that too much liberal feminism is prescriptive feminism, which is not empowering. Um, I'm interested in, though, as the Me Too movement is raging particularly, there do seem to be some real issues, some real threats to women. And I know there's been a lot of concern as the Trump administration as the Department of Education looks to reform Title IX because of the many problems with due process and injustice 
and uh, because it doesn't allow victims to have law enforcement. But from your perspective, what do we do as conservative women um, to address these real issues that threaten women's safety and to keep women safe? What, what is a better substitute? Well, it's, it's about knowing what you're okay with, making sure that, that you properly uh, converse what you're okay with, what you're not okay with. Um, uh, so many times, again, we get into this where, you know, a woman's been drinking and, and then, you know, she accuses a man and, and we just, we have to be strong in ourselves in order to say, hey, I've had too much to drink. I'm, I need to get out of the situation, turn to possibly female friends or, or a guy that, you know, you wouldn't possibly think would do anything and, and ensure on yourself that you won't do anything. Um, can, you know, looking into how much you drink, looking into your actions when you do drink and, and what do you do. Um, and as conservative women, I think we really need to send out that, that message of, of empowerment, of don't let someone else tell you what you, like know what you can handle, know what you're okay with, and be okay stating it, stating it instead of waiting some other time and saying, well, he, he, it wasn't this way and you know, I couldn't say, you know, like say something, we need to be able to speak up. It, it's, can I just, inter yeah. it's interesting to me though that what you've just said is very common sense. It's what any mother would tell her little girl when she goes off to college. It's, it's the type of things that you would think, um, you know, uh, this would be advice given by the you know, adults or some sort of counselors to new students. If you said any of that stuff, oh, yeah. it is victim blame, blaming, it's, it's, it's slut shaming, whatever right. you want to call it. It's taken, I mean, wh wh completely taken away women's agency. Absolutely, but it's, all, it's only like, look, I mean, my, my, my child is, you know, when they go off to college, 17 to 18 years old, they're young, you know, mm -hmm. and they're not adults. And there's some really good adult guidance. I mean, our college is starting to, to recognize that this is useful for girls. No, right. not, no, not at all. It's all blame men and, and you know, come to Title IX if you have a problem. Don't go to the police, come to us. And they're actively telling women that the police will not help you and they will, be, you know, they'll insult you and, and treat you terribly. So come to us. We'll get him for you, is, is essentially the message being told on colleges. So as conservative women, we can be out there in the media and hope that someone's going to listen to us or in groups like this and hope that someone's going to hear it. But we need to be telling our, our daughters, our friends, our sisters, our, you know, our, our aunts, aunt, nieces, everybody that you can that, you know what, you, you need to take matters into your own hand and you need to be a strong woman. And if something like this truly does happen to you, the, 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 the uh, campus administration is not able to help you because all they can do is kick the guy off campus. Well, then what happens when you leave campus or anyone else? Like, you do need to think, wait, what, a, what can you do for the other women? Like, if this is truly a bad guy who's committed a crime, he should be behind prison. I agree with you on that. I, I'm disturbed by the way that when we talk about Title IX and we talk about due process, women are too often left out of the equation. Part of due process is having a legal system where people who committed a crime end up behind bars with the full weight of evidence and the certainty of the legal system. But I think you talked a little bit about how administration has um, a motive to pull you in to become an alternative to law enforcement. And Julie, I want you to talk about this a little bit too. Um, you know, it's, what is the motive um, behind these activists, whether they're in environmental movements or whether they're in campus sexual politics? What is the motivation for them to do something that sometimes has really unfortunate unintended consequences? Well, at least, I, you know, I don't know about sexual politics. I think that a little bit of it is, is um, maintaining that idea that women are living in terrible times, that they're very vulnerable, you know. Um, you know, we see the same thing with the wage gap and these, these sort of myths that, that just stick around. But at least with the environmental organizations and the GMO, it's money, it's pure money. A um, hundred Nobel laureates uh, wrote a letter um, objecting to how Greenpeace um, was was spreading misinformation in Africa. I mean, it was, it was Greenpeace was very active in Africa, and these Nobel laureates wrote this quote. I wrote it down it's in this open letter. It said, "Greenpeace initially, and then some of their allies, deliberately went out of their way to scare people about GMOs. It was a way for them to raise money for their cause." And I think activists, we can always you can always sort of you know, like follow the money. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of money and fear. 
um, no matter what that is, fear, fear of being a woman, fear of fear of, um, of, of GMOs and technology and all sorts of stuff. Um, it's very profitable. So that to me is the motivation. Also power, yes. right? Yes. You have power over someone yeah. as a victim yep. these days because now you can't, you can't touch me. I, I'm a victim, you know, like you see yeah. it. Um, you know, especially, you know, in campus sexual assault, but even with the, the Parkland shooting victims where if, you know, the, the survivor students that have come out to speak and some of them, you know, will say something and if you say that, you know, that you're factually incorrect, you can't say that I'm a survivor, right? right? right. I, I mean, it's, it's this power in victimhood and there is an absolute power in this kind of activism by, you know, by you with yours saying, you can't do that because you're hurting that group of people. Well, now you're somehow in charge of that group of people. It's, it's just power and money, and I money. would say. So when, when we have this victim culture, one of the things I've noticed it do is uh, marginalize the focus on people who truly are victims. Um, and Claudia, I, I want you to talk a little bit about what you've seen traveling and reporting um, and, and sort of what you see as the most critical threats to women's safety worldwide. Sure, well, let me draw a direct connection. It's kind of important that we sort out this problem in our culture because as far as I can see, saving the world really depends on us, okay? I mean, if there's another backup out there, I would love to know. But, <coughs> sorry, that come across? But I don't see it. And on that score, you know, feminism, women, and so on, I, there, there are two pieces to this and one my two colleagues here might be better placed to address. One is that exactly that thing of sort of using, generating, use, take, latching onto a cause to generate money and power. Um, in international politics, that goes on big time at places like the United Nations, where you'll find uh, all sorts of people living quite well, and they aren't actually helping the women that they propose to help, but they're doing quite well themselves. Um, that's sort of one feature pertaining to women that belongs generally to a lot of things that involve government planning. Um, on saving the world, may I just give you a little brief thing on that? Because uh, there's a lot to think about right now. It's been a very interesting week. And Jillian was asking us, are you optimistic, pessimistic? And I'm thinking, OK, I need to factor out how I felt yesterday. <laughs> um, because it was. Quite a relief that this terrible Iran deal has been, uh, that we're pulled out of it. But uh, let's try it just to look quickly at the big picture. This is really an amazing country. And um, it is easy, immersed as we are in all of its details and difficulties, to lose sight of just how important we are in setting a standard that matters for the entire world. And I'm not talking about being, you know, Cinderella perfect. I'm talking about um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we have become the world's superpower in a most unusual way. It's normally done by conquest, rape, pillage, and so on. That was the historical tradition. We did it by becoming a free society. We did it by having free markets. We did it by having votes. We did it by becoming a place where you could get quite rich if you simply did things that other people, produced things other people wanted to buy. And that's given us an extraordinary position. And at the same time, like any giant, we have our ups and downs. In 1940, Winston Churchill spent the first year and a half, well, 40, 41, the first year and a half of his time as prime minister trying to save Britain from the Nazis, praying that America would enter the war. And when we finally did, he wrote in his memoirs that he went and slept the sleep of the saved. Because once we got in, he knew that we were going to win. And these things go up and down. Fast forward to 1980, when we were really kind of in trouble. 1980, I think most of you weren't born then, <laughs> but, but I was, and I remember it. And it was a tough time. Uh, the Soviet Union had just invaded Afghanistan. There had just been the Islamic Revolution in Iran. We were reading books like Why Democracies Perish. Uh, Jean Kirkpatrick was around writing brilliant essays about how bad this all was. And it really didn't look good. And then this country elected Ronald Reagan. And by the end of the 1990s, we were, the Soviet Union was on its last legs. It fell, and briefly there was this euphoric stretch 
wow, the end of history, everything's great. We're all gonna be democracies now, everything's fine. And you know, just bring in the women from St. Petersburg, get them a good haircut, rename the city, and we're okay. <laughs> okay, well, it's human beings. We, uh, human nature doesn't change that much. Um, Quick anecdote from that time, 1993, I was working in the Wall Street Journal's Moscow Bureau. It was September, which meant it was 40 degrees outside. And uh, the power went out in the building. And as the Iranians and the Yemeni defense attache assembled by the fuse box to try and figure out why, I had a story I had to file because there was a rumor going around that Igor Gaidar, one of the reform uh, officials of the day, was coming back into the Kremlin. He'd been out, he was coming back, it was always like that. Well, I had no power, I had no anything. It was really not easy to file anything. I was sort of a mad scramble. And finally, I managed to get things pulled together. And freezing and angry and miserable, I filed my miserable story to the foreign desk of the Wall Street Journal. And then the power came back on. And I decided, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this mess. And since I had power, I called up Douglas North. He's now, he died a few years ago, but he won the Nobel Prize for studying the interaction between politics and economics how it is that these two things interact in countries around the world and through history. And I dug, because I had the great good fortune to be on a first name basis with this marvelous man. Doug, how long is this going to take before they sort this out in Russia? Because I'm reading articles that say it could be, you know, three years, five years. He said, oh, it'll take at least 50 years. I said, oh, good. Why? He said, because you're gonna have to have at least two generations for pe before people are going to really <laughs> learn how the institutions work. That's how long it takes to really change and establish things. Okay, good. Well, Russia, we're <laughs> now into the second generation and it's really going the wrong direction at this point. But just to move ahead and let's get caught up to the present so we can move on to the, um, things didn't work out quite as brilliantly as everyone hoped in 1993. By 2001, we had the terrorist attacks on the United States. Suddenly, terrorism was really big on the horizon. Um, the Iraq War, tremendous controversy, uh, which divided this country, and I think left us very much averse to things that we should have done on other fronts to follow up, but President Bush spent his second term backing away from all these things. We got a terrible deal on North Korea, which fell apart as President Obama was coming in. Yep. Then the country elected President Obama, who tried to a pod approach of engaging with our enemies, pulling, sort of drawing down the US, uh, downsizing the military, and we got, this was a disaster. One of the reasons it was a disaster is that there is no world policeman. Okay, the United Nations is a collective, it's an animal farm. That's what you're looking at there, and it's not going to help you. You can go there and say this is unfair, and they'll say that's fine, can we make money on it? Um, but. There is no policeman. You're looking for some higher power where you know you have to get into religion before you're going to get, which does isn't really a, a place you can go to with your daily complaints about foreign policy. And the closest proxy for that since at least World War II has been the United States. And it's the world's great good fortune and ours that we have a moral compass. We have a government that answers to an electorate <coughs> where when we're unhappy, we elect somebody else. That really makes a difference. Um, and trying to reduce the importance of the United States had terrible effects. We had then the bungled intervention in Libya. Russia grabbed Crimea, which was actually huge because what that said is countries can now take territory of other countries. China began building artificial islands in the South China Sea. If that sounds far away and obscure, they are now topped with military runways. These are bases that threaten major shipping lanes for Japan, our closest ally in East Asia. This is actually very big. We're heading into terrain where China at this point is playing the role that a militarizing Japan was playing in the 1930s. That's part of what's so dangerous. Um, we had uh, with Syria, Russia invited in to promising that it would stop the use of chemical weapons, which again is another taboo that was broken and it's very important that it was broken. You really don't want a world in which the brother of the North Korean dictator is assassinated with VX nerve agent in the Malaysian airport, or a Russian double agent is, is attacked with his daughter with Novichok 
nerve agent from Russia. But that's what's going There's on. There's a reason Claudia yeah. um, is on right before the beer uh, is available in the lobby. <laughs> yes, well, let me wrap this up. So we were heading into very, very dangerous times. And what's been happening is as America retreated, people, all these bad actors were emboldened. There was the, terror, the Iran nuclear deal where you can get into lots of detail, but basically it didn't stop Iran getting the bomb and it gave it a pass on being the world's state's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Um, North Korea got to the point of testing what was probably a hydrogen bomb last September. Six nuclear tests and not stopped. Something had to be done. I am this country elected Donald Trump. Now, wherever you stand on him, his foreign policy has been a dramatic improvement in that he really has been standing up to our enemies. When he, when he made airstrikes in Syria last year and then again targeting specific facilities last month, that was a statement that the world pays attention to. When he pulled us out of the Paris Climate Treaty, which was a gift to China, literally a gift by President Obama, he never sent it to the Senate for ratification. He brought it to China having signed it himself. He used the UN as the proxy for the Senate. That's a very dangerous thing. President Trump pulled us out of that. It was important for reasons that go beyond the enormous transfer of wealth that would have been entailed. Um, and what he just did in taking us out of the Iran nuclear deal was another message to the rest of the world that America is not going to be snookered or played, that we're, you're now dealing with a serious power. Um, I will conclude there with the release of the three hostages from North Korea that Mike Pompeo just brought home. Yes. Um, both a word of celebration and of caution. Uh, it's wonderful that they're home. North Korea has scarfed up hostages like this for years. We had Bill Clinton go over to bring them home in 2009, Jimmy Carter go over to bring them home in 2010, um, James Clapper, I forgot whether it was 2013 or 14, and then the horrible return of Otto Warmbier last year in a vegetable state and to die Japanese, in front of the his Japanese, parents. for decades, yeah. the Japanese. We have, exactly, they hold abducted Japanese South Koreans, possibly even uh, and another American by the name of David Snedden, a big question mark, we don't know if they have him. Well, but, I, but the qu thing there is they return him, but they return these people does it mean that North Korea has changed? No. It means that what's going on in this country is possibly requiring North Korea to react differently. But the character of North Korea hasn't changed. What's happening is the US is putting different conditions to them. So cautiously optimistic, and thanks for listening to that whole tour of the last half century. <laughs> I love the point that you make about the importance of restoring American credibility through American values. And that's something that I see so profoundly under attack on college campuses. I've spent the last couple months digging through intersectional feminist literature. And uh, it's, it's been mind opening in that I think the most fair critique they have is that the United States hasn't always perfectly lived up to its values, but in many respects, we see improvement with women's rights, with the rights of minorities. We see improvement on that. But there's a temptation on the left to try to tear down systems because they are not perfect. And there's a kind of glamour in that tear down the system um, mentality. And what I think is interesting and unique about this panel is there are systems on the left that need to be torn down, that have a profit motive, that have corrupt and, and dysfunctional systems. And I, I think you three are all women who tear those systems down. Um, Julie, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about one of those systems that's ripe for tearing down. Um, some of the alarmism that you see going on on mommy blogs oh. and some of the profit motives within that. Yeah. Um, I know you all want to hear about sex, but um, we'll, get we'll there. shift to the parenting issues. And, you know, Claudia mentioned um, the the fact that things have improved in the world um, and it's still dangerous but you know we live in better times and when you look at the data out there people are living longer than ever before they have uh, better access to health care I mean there obviously are problems in that field as well um, literacy is up poverty is down crime is down there's just so many great data points and then you have sort of this parenting culture that tells you uh, you need to worry constantly your child is going to be taken or you're going to expose them or brush up against something 
something that makes them uh, damaged in some way. And it makes uh, parenting joyless, it makes it harder, it makes it stressful. Um, and again, many of the same actors uh, that I mentioned that are rallying against GMOs do the same thing. There's a whole universe out there of um, environmental groups that try to scare women. And again, it's it's a profit issue. Um, so, you know, it's important that I think people um, understand that this movement exists because when you cave to it, when you believe in it, um, it alters your consumer behavior and it um, it creates, a, it invites regulation. And so, um, again, most of that uh, action is to get these environmental groups want a great deal of regulations on industry, and they they also make money off this. Gotcha. What so, are you telling moms? well, look. I mean, if for instance, I have three little boys, and so from the instant I had those children, I was told I had to breastfeed. If formula touched their lips, they would go down 14 IQ points. Um, I was told I had to be a stay-at-home mom because daycares are dangerous. I was told, you know, I shouldn't work. I was told then, then, I'm not even talking about the products, everything from the, the crib sheets to the crib itself to the curtains to the shower to the soap to the shampoo to the diapers I was using. And look, you look at Jessica Alba, right? She has this honest company. That is built on lies, total and complete lies. She says her products are better. It's baloney. But there's so much profit to be made in this and again you know women and then you get the, the issue with organic food my goodness you know they're going to come in contact with pesticides if you buy a conventional package of strawberries versus the very expensive organic strawberries okay and, and women some women buy the organic because they say well you don't use pesticides which is a lie because there are certain classes of pesticides you can use but let's say I let's say I, I, I got the conventional strawberries right and my kid is going to get some residue of pesticides right you want to know how many strawberries my child would have to eat before they reach a toxic level, 1,500 strawberries before they reach the EPA's toxicity level, okay? Now, my child's stomach would explode, so they'd actually die of another cause before they could be poisoned by the toxic strawberries, and yet, you have groups like the EWG telling women that there's a dirty dozen list, that you really should buy the organic and the more expensive produce. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that makes it harder, and actually, they have studied the shopping habits, the purchasing habits of people who are, are on and, and below the poverty level, and it turns out they get so freaked out by this messaging that, oh, you know, organic's better, and oh gosh, all these pesticides, that those most people are actually not buying the cheaper, the cheaper fresh food. They're passing on it because they're so afraid. So there are costs to this, and often it, it hurts the most vulnerable in the population. Yeah, I, I think it's always fair to be skeptical when someone tries to scare you into things, tell you that their motive is completely pure, and then buy the, buy right. the more expensive product. Right, right, right. Um, but shifting gears a little bit into campus sexual politics, sometimes I wonder if we're selling ourselves short, if, if we're asking too little. And I want you to talk a little bit um, about the culture of consent. And of course, consent is an important thing, but speaking more broadly about sex on campus, um, where has feminism gone wrong that women are having this experience where they feel traumatized constantly, where, where they feel that yeah. they can't ask for not only consent, but for respect? Can you talk a little bit about where you see the origins of that in our culture? I mean, I guess it would have been starting in the, the 80s with, with third wave feminism, um, the Andrea Dworkins of the world writing that basically a woman would ne could never consent to sex because no woman would ever either want that or, or whatever. Um, and so that basically all sex is rape. Um, so it, it starts with that, and these are feminist scholars, right, writing this stuff, and uh, naturally, what did the left do that the right never did and that the right doesn't seem interested in doing, even though it should, is go into academia. The 60s radicals went into academia, took over, so that's why we have these, these indoctrination area issues, because the people that were back in the 60s, right, with, there was a, everything was war and everything, and they were kind of right about it, and, you know, free love for everyone goes into the colleges, so then we have this free love for decades, these hookup cultures, and then, you know, fourth wave victimhood, fainting couch feminism, whatever you want to call it, comes in and, and starts saying that what once was a hookup is now rape, you know, if, if she's been drinking. It's not that it could possibly be that they're essentially both raping each other, right? Because that's, it, they're both drunk. That's what it is. Um, and in, 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 
before you ask how absurd that is, there was actually a woman at Duke University, one of the Title IX people, who was asked under oath if a man and a woman had, were both equally drunk and had sex, essentially raping each other, who's responsible for getting consent? And she said, it's the man. So, I mean, that that's literally what these people are, are not only teaching college students, but um, Title IX officials who are adjudicating these things are being taught to believe such things that um, the trauma-informed is what they call it, which essentially says she, she's not lying. There's, there's no way that she's lying. And I was actually at a symposium earlier this year with a Title IX official who reminded people that they're being taught that because the case of one student was brought up. Um, one of the attorneys, has uh, his client, was saying that they're, you know, they'd been drinking, they hook up, the next day she's sending him, she's sending him texts, like reaching out to him saying, I had a wonderful time with smiley face emojis and everything. And then like the next day she says she was raped and she's traumatized. And, you know, most people, common sense would be like, hmm, really? Like you were, you were totally fine. And then hours like, what happened? Like there was, you know, people on campus or feminist friends that are saying, oh, no, you were drunk, you didn't consent to that, or blah, 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 you know? And what the Title IX official was saying was that you're, they're being taught, and she said this as a, like, a proudly kind of, that you're dealing with people who've been taught that that doesn't mean anything, that the way she acts right afterwards, being friendly, means nothing, because they're teaching in this trauma-informed that that's just an evidence of trauma. If she later says she was sexually assaulted, then literally everything she's done is evidence of trauma. So the smiley faces. Well, she was just so scared, she was trying to make sense of it. Oh, well, you know, she didn't say no. Well, she was so scared, she didn't say no. Well, you know, she, she kept going out with him and having sex with him for like months after. Well, she was so scared, she had to keep doing it. And that's what they say. And then if she's being in, uh, spoken to, right, if she's being uh, interviewed, then uh, if her story is wildly inconsistent, or, you know, keeps changing, well, that's evidence that she's scared and traumatized. Oh, if her story's consistent, that she's also probably trauma. Like, everything is evidence of trauma. And so there are issues where people react to trauma differently, but what's happening on college campuses is that they're starting with the diagnosis that she is traumatized, therefore everything is evidence of that, rather than, well, this could be or could not be, and we have to rely on other things to piece it together. It's, it's from the beginning. And you see that even with campus police are being taught this uh, out of the University of Texas system was telling their police officers not to interview the woman multiple times because she might, you know, uh, give some inconsistent statements and then the defense could use that against her and to basically anticipate what the defense will say and then make sure you, co your, you conduct your investigation to counteract that. So basically, police would no longer be independent fact checkers. They would be, you know, an arm of the prosecution trying to find that this guy was responsible. Um, and, and so I really think that it was, um, you know, bubbling up in the 80s and 90s, but back then, you know, you hear Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Paglia talking about they've been fighting this for years, but back in the 90s, the media and, and um, comedians were on our side now with calling out the ridiculousness. I mean, you talk about affirmative consent where you basically have to ask for permission ahead of everything you do, and so, you know, on the one side, that's like, that doesn't sound so bad, but in practicality, it, it is, can I hold your hand? Can I kiss you? Can I put my arms around you? Can I move here? Can I put my hands here? And you're basically having to do the same thing back, although it never applies to the woman. But so essentially you get to the point where it's like, on every, you know, there's literally been the question asked, well, do you have to ask on every thrust if you're still okay with this? <laughs> I mean, how far does it go? <laughs> but this was like back in the 90s, SNL made fun of this. Whereas now, you know, everybody is, is on board with this, saying this is right, this is what you have to do without any thought of the practicality of it. And the thought that, you know, it's basically questions because 
anything could be misinterpreted in, into your article, you know, what was the bias at Michigan State that was saying, you know, it, it doesn't matter, like it's your feelings that matter. So, so that's what we're seeing on college campuses is that your feelings, your subjective feelings matter, not the evidence or the feelings of the other person, it's you, all you. And I think it's just really started, mostly I would say that dear colleague letter from the Obama administration in 2011. You know, this there, is the one that set up the campus kangaroo courts? Right, the campus kangaroo courts. And so, yeah, we had issues where schools were, you know, throwing rape and sexual assault under, under the rug because they didn't want to, you know, be known for being a dangerous school. But then that dear colleague letter came out and suddenly everybody with any kind of grievance or no grievance at all, but just wants attention. I mean, you read some of these um, accusations and it's like this this doesn't even make sense on its face. Like uh, one woman who's very famous for her claim alleged she was, you know, like sexually assaulted twice in like her first two weeks and one of them like bashed her head against the wall so bad that when she woke up the next morning there was a pool of blood that had dripped down from her pillow onto the floor and yet no one else talked about this. She didn't go to the hospital with something that should probably have put you in a coma that much blood loss if you were still having fresh blood in the morning. And yet, uncritically, just she says she's a victim, she's a victim. Put her all, give her a book deal, give her, put her in a movie, put her all over the place, it's fine. And so after that dear colleague letter with this, this um, basically telling more women to come forward and telling them that every bad feeling is trauma and that you have post-traumatic stress disorder because the guy didn't call you the next day. And so it's just been escalating to where it is now and then it's just gonna get worse when there's just these constant witch hunts and when you have real stories of problems like with Harvey Weinstein, we saw what happened with Me Too where it starts out with an accusation like Harvey Weinstein which is you know, the, the epitome of sexual harassment, assault and rape and then going on to Aziz Ansari's bad date. And I mean, I don't think most people in this room would even like a, you know, the New York Times guy, Glenn Thrush, but his accusations to me were like, are you kidding me? This is like all coworkers out drinking. He goes to kiss, she moves back, and it was like the end of it. But now it's like, we gotta try and get him fired. And, and it's, it's become just, so taboo to question a lot of this stuff. Right, exactly. Uh, it's become something that you can't do because then you are, perpetuating rape culture, you're right. an enabler, you're a believer in toxic masculinity. Yeah. My Julie, truth, you're, you're, you're saying no to my truth and my truth matters more than the truth or your truth. Julie, you've really come under fire um, for challenging other dogmas similar to that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what's gone on behind the scenes when you've taken on some of these establishments, some of the vitriol personally directed at you and your family. I've been pretty lucky. It, it hasn't been anything, you know, certainly not like um, being a female in the Trump administration, but, um, but it, it, it is, um, you know, there are, there's real passion. For instance, the anti-vax uh, movement, um, you know, vaccinations save lives. They've saved millions of lives. They are, you know, wonder of human ingenuity and discovery. And um, it is, it's, it's really terrible. The anti-vax movement um, and, and sort of its supporters um, are very smart in their messaging. And I've never seen passion or anger that, uh, about any issue than I have about, the, at least in my space, but about the anti-vax movement. And it's very hard. What, what I try to do, I always believe there are three categories of people. There are the people that are just such true believers, no matter what you say, they will never believe vaccines are safe. They think they cause autism and a number of other, they can lead to death. Um, and then there are the people who, like me who are true believers. But there is a, there's this whole medium, the, a space in the middle of people who really can be convinced and want to be reassured and want to know that there's better information. And they're kind of suspect of conspiracy theories. And that's that's really, I, I always believe you make fun of sort of the person you know who's like got their head on fire. You don't make fun of the person who's really afraid because there's a re I have a lot of sympathy for people who are afraid. There's a lot of information. Today, you know, it used to be, a like, hundred years ago, it was people didn't have information. Now they have too much and they don't know how to sift through it. And so, um, so I, would, I would find that one to be the most vicious and I've written quite a bit on the vaccine movement um, and, and seeing the passion and the dangerous things people do for going vaccines has been, it's, it's very disturbing and depressing. 
So Claudia, another one that's been really difficult to take on at a challenge that promotes immediate vitriol is the Iran deal, yet here we are today. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could present that other perspective because we do hear so much about, oh, like the options are binary. If you want a deal with Iran, this is it. Otherwise, you get a nuclear Iran. What's the alternative argument? The Iran deal was a fake, okay? Uh, that word is loaded in Washington, but out in the rest of America, it just means it was phony. Um, <clears throat> I would go back to Neville Chamberlain returning from his meeting in which he obtained the piece of paper from Herr <laughs> Hitler in Germany. I have here a piece of paper. Well, in the case of the Iran deal, which, uh, for which the official name is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action enshrined under, as an annex, under resolution, UN Security Council Resolution 2231. Man, that two, rolls off the tongue. Yeah, it does. <laughs> of 2015, it was more like, I regard it as Wendy Sherman's dissertation. Um, but it was a lot of pieces of paper. And uh, the basic problem is it didn't guarantee anything. Okay, the way that the Obama administration got Iran to sign on to this deal was it lowered the least common denominator to the point where it was acceptable to Russia, which has been selling Iran nuclear technology since at least the 1990s with the Boucher reactor, to China, which has been such a major crossroads of Iranian nuclear and missile procurement that uh, if any of you wants a cool five million bucks, um, there's a $5 million reward on the head of one of the major Chinese dealers with procurement dealers for the Iranian nuclear and missile programs. That reward has been out there since I think at least 2014. His name is um, Le, uh, what is his name? Um, Li Feng Wei, also known as Carl Li. He has a whole lot of aliases. Anyway, he works out of northeastern China and uh, the US government put a price on his head after demarching the Chinese about him for 10 years, put a price on his head of $5 million, and he still hasn't been brought in. So that's how seriously China takes the stopping the Iran nuclear program. Um, it had to be acceptable to them. It had to be acceptable to the Iranian regime, which, as I think uh, the Israeli prime minister, I think reliably did tell us last week, with that amazing intelligence coup and they <laughs> scarfed up part of the secret archive, was of course working on nuclear weapons. I mean, Iran doesn't need nuclear power. It's one of the world's major oil gas countries, okay? They've got enough to live on for a long time, but they've been working on a nuclear program for years and years. It's, it's one of these things where it's been clearly for weapons, proving that to the satisfaction, say, of a civil court would be difficult, but it's dead obvious what they're doing. And um, when all of these people, all of these players had to be satisfied for this deal to be agreed upon. And what that produced was a deal where it guaranteed really nothing. When um, former Secretary of State John Kerry says, oh, we were, we were nego we spent years negotiating it. I was there when they began these actual negotiations, okay, in Vienna at the first and second round of these talks. They had a fascinating newsroom. It had everything but news. They had free strudel, they had whipped cream, <laughs> they had cappuccino, they had electrical outlets, which for reporters are really big. I mean, like, it was, it was a dream electrical outlet set up. <laughs> uh, yes. Everything. This was set up for reporters to die of happiness covered in strudel and whipped cream. <laughs> the only thing it didn't have was actual news because they were all off discussing this thing in this beautiful place called the Palais Coburg. Uh, and it went on for round after round. The Obama administration initially promised that this whole thing would be done in six months, wrapped up, done and dusted. Actually, it went on for a year and a half. They discussed and negotiated. Why did it go on so long? Because Iran kept saying, no, we're not going to agree to that. No, we want this. They refused to put missiles on the table. Well, if you are ever a rogue state with your own rogue nuclear program, one thing that you will need to deliver your rogue nuclear warheads are missiles, quite likely. Okay, The reason they're making ballistic missiles is to deliver nuclear warheads. But I and thought this was about energy. Uh, yeah, exactly. We're getting ever farther from this myth. And what went on during this entire time, the lead negotiator was a woman named Wendy Sherman, 
um, who is widely credited with having been a big part of the North Korea framework that failed in the 90s. That's actually not quite accurate. Um, she was there, she was a congressional liaison uh, that she wasn't part of engineering that deal. What she was, was in the second term of the Clinton presidency, uh, the sidekick to Madeleine Albright as they tried to cut a missile deal with North Korea. And um, which included the shameful episode in which one of North Korea's top ranking uh, military officials, Marsh, Vice Field Marshal Cho, uh, was invited to Washington and had a 45 minute sit down with Bill Clinton at the White House, which is widely forgotten. But he was welcomed with such effusive praise and compliments by Wendy Sherman and by Madeleine Albright. That was prelude to the famous trip in 2000 where Madeleine Albright went to North Korea to get this missile deal. Champagne. Yeah, and ex instead got a stadium display of the launch of a long range North Korean missile. Anyway. That was the lead negotiator, Wendy Sherman, the same, uh, who welcomed vice the North Korean marshal to the White House and to Washington, who was the lead negotiator until finally John Kerry took it over, well, at, you know, sort of after more than a year of Iran saying no, no, no. They took missiles off the table. They let Iran keep its uranium enrichment facilities. That's important. Again, if you ever want to get into like really dirty business, um, I urge you, you want a legitimate cover, always, okay? You want to launder money, you should have a legitimate working grocery store or something, and then you launder money under that, okay? <laughs> you want to have an illicit nuclear program? Well, have a legitimate uranium enrichment thing because you're doing research. They took the mountain where they discovered this uh, nuclear facility carved out under a mountain that Iran wasn't supposed to have. Um, under this deal, the agreement was, okay, that you can keep it. It's just going to be for research now. Uh, likewise, it, it went on and on like that. This deal came with sunset clauses where a lot of the restrictions were going to go away. But basically, a lot of the restrictions were never going to be really enforced anyway. This was a deal, this was like making a deal with the mob where you say, okay, we're going to pay you off and trust that that'll be enough so you don't come for us. And Iran said, okay, we'll take the payoff. They took, one, the, they took the lifting of sanctions, they took the okay on you can uh, enrich uranium. They also are getting our help under this deal. If you read it, if you want to go to sleep, I recommend reading it. You can find it on the UN website or just Google UNSC2231, JCPOA. Oh um, <laughs> it's catchy. It's how I got up this morning. I was reading it last night. Uh, you read this stuff, it'll stick with you, watch out. Um, but, but they, uh, in the doing of it, it just promises all these things. We are supposed to provide Iran with nuclear technology, okay? So they'll have a very safe nuclear program. It's sort of a kind of a version of sex on campus. You know, it's like, we're, we're, it's, it addresses everything but actual problems. And this whole thing, it's the reason that the Israelis were screaming, this is deadly, it was. And uh, what it, and oh, and by the way, it was something where Iran could at any point find a pretext to say, you guys are in violation and walk away. The Europeans love this deal because it let them start doing business again with Iran without risking US sanctions. They're making, they've been making money out of it. Uh, that's why they're protesting and howling. Also, Europe, I'm sorry to say this, I love Europe, it has great perfume, food and wine, <laughs> but it, it is not known for courage in the face of, ambitious predatory <laughs> dictatorships <laughs> refer you back to why we need the US culture to fix itself up. Um, anyway, all of that was what went through and that is what much with as with the Paris Climate Treaty, President Obama never took to the Senate for ratification as a treaty. Again, the UN became his proxy for the American Senate. Within a week, less than a week of the deal being announced, he hustled it over to the UN, Samantha Power, not all women are good. This is part of the yeah. feminist thing. Like yeah. Women should be judged on what they do. I think Nikki Haley's fantastic. Yes. Um, Samantha Power, in my opinion, is somewhat lower. Um, introduced this, and it was immediately and unanimously approved uh, by, boom, we had the Iran deal at the UN, and then presented to Congress. Here, debate this if you want to. You'll enjoy it. They did it all summer, revealing incredible flaws with this deal, but it was a done deal. And that's what it is. And when President Trump said he was going to 
get rid of it as soon as he was elected. I, for one, hoped that he would, because it doesn't actually guarantee our safety. The big question is, what will we do now? Iran will start to enrich. Well, that's been the problem even with the deal. And at least now, if Iran starts to enrich, the US is no longer sitting there saying, we're part of a deal where we, we want to preserve the deal. We have to be careful. It leaves us free to figure out what we do next. Um, but uh, as it is, I think President Trump, one final note on that, has done this very well. I was concerned when he, uh, th this deal was so complicated by the time it was done that it was hard to keep track. It was hard for anyone outside of Washington, or for that matter, Capitol Hill, to follow the legislative slate of hand with which it never came to an actual vote in the Senate. And not, it wasn't even presented, not just as a treaty, but in any grounds. Um, but the, uh, the way that it worked was the president has to waive U.S. sanctions. U.S. sanctions would be reimposed. They were lifted under the deal, nuclear sanctions lifted under the deal, and the president would then have to waive them every, I think it's six months. So that was how you kept the deal in place, was the president would waive sanctions. President Trump began doing that when he came in, and I thought, uh-oh, it was a phony campaign promise. He's not going to do it. That's really bad news, because this deal was dangerous. Uh, and he has, as it turns out, waited until he has in place a team that I think I have never seen a better qualified lineup to, to handle the complexities of how you now maneuver between Iran, its longtime business partner in weapons, North Korea. They're very much related like that. Uh, this is all connected, what's happening right now. And he's got Ambassador John Bolton, who's been following this and thinking about it for years, and I think it was a brilliant pick. Mike Pompeo, the same thing. And he's now trying to deal with this. It's one of the reasons to be optimistic. And if people are saying, oh my god, Iran will now produce nuclear weapons, well, what do people think they were doing anyway? Thank you. Well, um, as we kind of round this up, um, one thing I think that women should never be afraid of is asking questions. So I would like you to ask some. Um, anybody got a question for our wonderful panelists? <laughs> Nobody? I guess we covered it. Oh, yes. As they say in Washington, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> it was one of the things that was made so complicated, it was hard to follow. But just to try and quickly simplify it, uh, under the deal, once there were all, president, sanctions on Iran go way, way back, OK? But in 2006, the, under President Bush, for the first time, the UN imposed nuclear sanctions on Iran. And then it began adding to the, sort of the way it's been doing with North Korea. It began accumulating the stack of them. Every time Iran would do something egregious, there would be another sanctions resolution and reports and so on. And the US began putting tougher and tougher sanctions on, trying to stop everything from shipping to banking and so on. Once the agreement was struck to negotiate a deal, which happened in 2013, uh, there was the interim deal, okay, in late 2013. The Obama administration began saying, okay, you can do some things, you can trade in some things. Uh, prior to that, try and make this simple, there was this insane calculation that went on where the Obama administration did not want to affect the world price of oil because of sanctions, which is sort of silly because these are, there are huge considerations in trying to contain a rogue nuclear state. The price of oil is a world market. It will sort itself out. But what they did was they picked uh, the six largest buyers of oil from Iran. And they told them China, uh, China, Japan, Turkey, I forget the rest, but that kind of list. And they said, you may buy 
up to, I think it was 80%, something like that, of your previous year's purchases of oil. And the money that you pay to Iran will go into escrow accounts. So they won't actually go to Iran, but it'll pile up as funds for Iran. Okay, this is, this is starting to sound complicated and ridiculous. Remember I told you earlier, if you ever want to do dirty business, set up, an, set up a legitimate business as cover. Well, of course, once you say to China, well, we're going to give you a quota of how much Iranian oil you can buy, well, China will manage to buy 300% of that quota, which is pretty much what happened. And all the money that was officially piled up was sitting there in these accounts offshore, sort of frozen, Iran couldn't get at them. When the deal was done, that money was released. That is the 100 billion that you're reading about, although the figure has been all over the place, 50 to 100 to 150 billion. That's one figure. Okay, that was the money that was piled up, waiting for, that was earned from Iran's oil exports. And this next set of, the next sort of slice of money, I think they call it buckets in Washington, the next mm -hmm. bucket of money, finance, was future income from the sales of oil, future sale of oil, which is going on right now, which is what Trump has just said, okay, no more. Um, because they were then free to do all sorts of business. And they've been sending ships to Africa. One of the things I look at is the merchant fleet. It's Latin America, all over the place, they've been selling to Europe. That's the next pile of money. And then there was the final bid. And this was somehow the most in-your-face offensive. What I've just described is money that Iran was able to access by selling what Iran produces, mainly oil. But President Obama also sent them 1.7 billion in cash, which you've probably read about. And that was, oh God, let me, let me quick, I don't want to take, I want to leave time for the rest, but no, no, that was, that was, yeah. man, somebody should make a movie. That was not part of the official deal, okay? That was just a cherry on top. That was, it was uh, dummied up, again, you want a legitimate cover for dirty dealings. It was dummied up as a settlement for uh, this, there's this obscure tribunal in The Hague um, that was set up when, after the Iran, Iran's Islamic Revolution to adjudicate disputes over funds sort of caught in between from the Shah, re, regime of the Shah, the US. And it had been winding very slowly through all these cases over many years. Uh, there was a case which actually was not due to come up for another five or six years. So President Obama should not have been worried about it at all. It would have been his predecessor's, his successor's problem. But it involved $400 million that uh, the Shah had paid to America for a weapons deal in the late 1970s. Then the Islamic Revolution took place in Iran. The weapons were not delivered. We, the America, sat around with $400 million that belonged to the Shah. The Tehran wanted that money back. All this was sort of waiting to be adjudicated somewhere out there in the 2020s. Instead, the Obama administration did a deal with Iran. He said, we'll settle over this, and we will pay you $1.3 billion in interest on this $400 million. Now, the $400 million was initially Iran's money. The $1.3 billion, those were your tax dollars. I mean, do the math. There are, what, 300 million Americans? You paid out of pocket for that. And... Um, if I may, the way that this happened was it happened on the same day that the Iran nuclear deal went into effect, mid-January 2016. And you may remember that weekend there were a number of American who were, Americans who were prisoner in Iran who were released, hostages who were released and flown home. It sure looked like a ransom payment. And the uh, Obama administration denied that it was. But they, what they didn't tell us was that this money had been paid at Iran's demand in cash shipped into Iran. That came out in the course of many months. Uh, the Wall Street Journal broke the story first that 400 million had been in cash and it went on like that. Now why would Iran want it in cash and why shipped into Iran? When you, again, if you're a rogue state and you're getting dirty money, or money from the United States shrink wrapped on pallets in cash. Um, you don't want that in your own country. Iran, they said, Iran said this is for infrastructure. I thought, yeah, right, they're paying their road workers in US dollars. 
Actually, actually, it wasn't U.S. dollars, it was euros. It was European banknotes because it was illegal to give Iranians U.S. dollars under U.S. sanctions. So the Obama administration had to launder our money to get it to Iran. And you, you ask for the cash because you're going to reroute it to, for things that can't be traced. And what do you do with that? That's not for roadworks. That's not for pistachio processing. You do that for funding terrorism. You do it for buying things like illicit missile components. And I'm going to tell you one more personal thing, and then about that. Uh, there was, the Wall Street Journal broke the story, the 400 million. I had a small part in breaking the story on the 1.3 billion. And I just have to tell you about this, because this was one of those jaw-dropping moments. Um, the Obama administration f sort of finally admitted, yes, we shipped 400 million in cash to Iran, which was pretty scandalous. But they wouldn't say anything about the remainder of this payment. What, how did the one point, what happened with the 1.3 billion? Mm -hmm. And there were news reports that nobody could figure out where it, you know, how it, where it came from, what happened with it, anything. It came, it had come from some obscure thing at Treasury called the Judgment Fund, used to settle cases against the, claims against the United States. And, Nobody seemed able to figure out anything more. Uh, well, I was, um, my husband is a former British military officer who was working at an edifying job in hospital security in the summer of 2016. And I was sitting up really late on Friday night playing around with a computer and I was reading these stories about this cash and thinking, well, what the heck? how could they send them 1.3 billion? How did, where, yeah, what? 1.3 billion is a lot of money. Hard to hide if you've got any kind of accounting system. And I thought, okay, judgment fund at Treasury. Punch it up and there's this big database, this huge database, because the US government pays out a lot of claims. And I, I search on Iran, nothing. I search on billion, nothing. I do various, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then finally think, okay, wait a minute. This had to go through for the State Department. It was a claim against them by the Iranians for a settlement. And we know it happened in January of 2016. I'm just going to go through this line by line. Wow. And I got to this number that looked like this. I'm going down this list of things, and I see something that just <laughs> 999,999,999. <laughs> Sorry, 900. 999. Just thousand, under a billion. One yeah. dollar under a billion. One penny under, okay. actually it was one penny under, under a million. A one penny under, uh, sorry, a hundred million. It was 99 million, sorry, 99 <laughs> million, 999,999 dollars. It was a lot of money. Cents. And I look and think, whoa, that's a penny under a hundred million. I wonder if there are 13 of those. Oh. And I count down and there are 13. Holy I think, God. that's it. That's this is the Iran payment. I think then my next thought is if I did this, I would be arrested the next day. But this is Treasury that did it. And I called them and they said, uh, we can't comment. They said, oh, come on. You know, you, one, you usually pay out, you know, 40,000, 30,000 from this fund. You just paid out one point, actually they had a 14th payment of about 10 million. I said, you just paid out 1.3 billion in 14 tranches on the day. The, the first World Bank Day after that whole thing went down. That has to be it. Can't run it. I called up my old Seth, editor, Seth Lipsky, and I said, we have them dead to rights. I just don't know how to do this because I can't confirm it. He said, we're going to run a story that says, why doesn't congressional investigators ask about 13 payments of 99999000 Anyway, State Department finally confesses, and that was enough so that the Wall Street Journal, which has much more spectacular sources than I do, was able to follow up and confirm, yes, they sent $1.7 billion total over the space of three weeks in cash to Iran. Well, $1.3 billion of that was your tax money. So that's a very long answer to your question about the money. Thank you. Unbelievable. Wow. All right, I think we have time for one more quick question. Yep. One of the things you alluded to was the fact that you're paying back to the society and the organization and the people who are at the center of it. And that is how you found your financial independence. Which is that a, a tricky thing to do for a people who are just trying to get ahead. Okay, I'll go first. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the Me Too, when it started spiraling, spiral. I can't say that word, out of, you know what I'm trying to say, out of control, um, which it did so pretty quickly. Um, uh, there would be a few like good catches in there, but a, a lot of it just ended up becoming any grievance any woman had 
with a man ever in her lifetime. Um, and so long as he had a famous name started, started coming out. Um, and I think that it did hurt. I mean, there was an article, I think it was like years ago, talking about um, congression, uh, congressmen who would you know, not exactly ha let the door close, right, with, or have private meetings with female staffers mm -hmm. for fear of this stuff. And that's been going on. And of course, the media portrays it as sexism and then claiming that, oh, your odds of this are like, it doesn't matter. They've all know somebody who's had this happen to them. Like they've, we've all known a girl that might have gone through something terrible. And then we've all known at least one girl that is just, gonna make some sort of accusation against somebody, right? Or has been making wild accusations for years. We all know that one girl at least. And so you've got, you know, these men and in, in, in any sort of space that Me Too took up. I mean, this was probably, I would say, it was definitely going on in Congress. It was probably already going on in the business world, you know, where, where businessmen didn't want to have, or would, there's the open door policy, the literal open door policy where the door does not close. Um, but I, I feel like maybe it had extended to Hollywood and uh, the New York legislature, because they have a, issues there, apparently. Um, and what were uh, other newspaper media outlets and Hollywood and, and places like that. So I would imagine it would extend at this point. And when you've drummed up so much hysteria over an issue, it's gonna have backlash. And in this case, unintended consequences are gonna end up hurting women where you're just too afraid to be alone with them or to especially hire any young woman or, uh, you know, like, but it's basically at a point where you can't win because you could get falsely accused or you could be accused of discrimination if you're, you're not, you know, hiring. So it just becomes, you know, you think the, well, just don't be a jerk. Well, like that's how most people in America operate, and yet you're now, this movement, plus the campus one, has been treating that every man out there is still some sort of animal that needs to be trained like a bear or something, because they just don't know that, you know, locking the door and forcing themselves on a woman or beating a woman without her, uh, you know, without it being some sort of BDSM consent, and there's your R rating, um, is, is wrong. And they're just treating it like this is how men go around life and that they've all been sitting there like this and that this movement is a reckoning to teach all men, all men basically being rapists without knowing. Um, and so I think it ends up hurting women a lot in the end. Um, I, I feel like it might help conservative women because, you know, we are those bold, empowered women that, you know, aren't making false accusations out there, so we might have some more trust in our arena. Um, you know, I don't feel like my bosses, <laughs> based on what I write about, would think I would falsely accuse them, but, uh, you know, that could open me up to other problems, but, you know, whatever. Well, I'm, I'm getting the sign that we're hitting time, so I don't know if we'll have time to, to wrap up that last question, but I think all of us are sticking around, so please come chat with us. Um, thank you yeah. so much for being in the audience. Yeah. And thank you to our wonderful panelists.